We are live on Facebook at Nicholas Kotar Fantasy Authors author page. It's a bit redundant, I apologize. Um, we're just about to get started uh, officially. I just, uh, a few technical checks. Eventually I will get proficient enough with this software to actually be able to put some sort of a screen with like a countdown on it. That would be ideal, but we're definitely not there yet. So just a little bit of your patience at the moment and we're gonna get started any minute now. <clears throat> Uh, I apologize for the music in the back, that will go away soon, but uh, COVID reality is complicated, shall we say. <laughs> nope, that's not it. Uh, oops. Nope. Nope. That's it. Okay. Almost ready, everybody. Thank you so much for your patience. <laughs> All right. Hello, hello, everybody. Uh, for those who do not know and who are stumbling here by accident, whether uh, they were pulled here by friends or just who knows for what reason, my name is Nicholas Kotar. I am a fantasy author. I am a blogger. I'm a podcaster. I'm a culture creator. I'm an Orthodox deacon. I'm a lot of things. And I'm also a father. And I'm also um, uh, a husband to a wonderful wife. And here is where I talk about books. I talk about fairy tales. I talk about storytelling. And I talk about the world, what I like in it, what I don't, the world of entertainment, the world of culture, and how we can live in it better, how we can live in it more intentionally, and how we can tell ourselves and others better stories so that we can learn how to better live through that storytelling. Um, today I wanted to talk about autumn. Have you felt it? That little bit of change in the temperature? That uh, it's no longer as hot as it used to be at night, sometimes over here. It's certainly already reached into the 30s one night. And just that's something ineffable about the air, about the quality of it, and of course the, the changing colors in a lot of places, you know, places that aren't, unfortunately, or fortunately, being burned down, as so much of the United States seems to be on fire right now. But this is always a time period for me that, maybe it's because I'm Orthodox, maybe it's because I'm a deacon, I always associate it with changes, with new beginnings. The liturgical New Year begins on September 1st, so perhaps that has something to do with it, having lived, having grown up in that sort of an atmosphere. But this year, I noticed it more than almost any other year in the last maybe five or ten years, certainly since I've been married. And that's definitely to do with COVID. I'm sure you you know what I mean. I mean, this summer, this this spring, I found myself being violently pushed between two completely opposing emotional states. One was this intense need to be as productive as humanly possible as suddenly I have this uh, expanses of free time in front of me. Not that I was affected um, all in terms of my work by COVID because I work from home anyway, uh, for the most part. But something about the intensity of the world being literally and figuratively on fire made me feel like, okay, I have to do as much as I possibly can in my own business, in my own work, in my own creativity, in my own productivity to bring some good fruit into this madness, right? But the other side of it was a sometimes, a sometimes intense and physically uh, debilitating sense of hope, not hopelessness, but meaning, not even meaninglessness. I'm not going to go that far. That's dangerous. But certainly a sense of what is the point of trying so hard, if everybody's at home anyway, if nothing seems to be moving, if nobody can seem to decide on the proper narrative for how to deal with this thing which i'm sure you've noticed the narrative the official narrative from the official scientist the unofficial scientist the president that everybody else about covid seems to be changing rather frequently um which is unfortunate for all of us who are trying to lead a meaningful life and then it struck me and it struck me in two ways first i um decided to in one of one of these moments of i don't know what I was on Amazon Prime looking for something, 
edifying to watch because I don't like to just constantly watch stuff that's entertainment. I, I like to occasionally watch things that make me think that that change my perspective on the way I live. Things that are, you know, edifying. And I stumbled on Eco Challenge Fiji. Um, you might think, what? Edifying? Eco Challenge, you know, bear with me. Eco Challenge Fiji, which is being now billed as the, mo the most, what is it, the most dangerous or the hardest or the most difficult uh, race in the world, something like this. I forgot the exact branding of it, but this is this is like basically um, a combination of Survivor and um, Amazing Race, but it's an actual sport. Uh, expedition expeditionary racing or adventure racing is an actual sport with an actual um, following. It's, it's almost has its own Olympics, uh, as it turns out. Um, hello, Moses. Good to see you. Um, and I didn't know what to expect, but as I'm watching this, I am astounded merely by the fact that there are actual professional adventure racers who make it their uh, life's point to race in these things where they literally, I'm not kidding, don't sleep for four to five days on end or like catch a nap for 10 minutes in between doing 26 miles on a stand-up paddle followed by 15 miles on foot, followed by 50 miles on a mountain bike, followed by eight miles in frigid water while swimming with a pack on your back, things like this. 66 teams of four people in each team doing this for the sake of a $100,000 prize. So obviously they're not doing it for the money. It's not that big of a prize. If you have four people, you have to divide it that way. Plus I'm sure that all of that gets, you know, gets disappeared in the process. It's definitely not the money. What is going on? And I'm looking at these people putting themselves through incredible feats of personal discomfort, incredible feats of pain. I mean, these, they're people that had to be helicoptered out because of infections. There was a story about one of them, uh, a team from Costa Rica who had done an expeditionary race in the past where one of the members had drowned and needed to be resuscitated. And that same member who had drowned and been resuscitated was back for more. And this time she finished the race. And it was actually a very uh, in inspiring story. But I'm looking at this and suddenly it really dawned on me in a kind of a painful way that there's something really wrong in my, my reception of what the, what's going on outside in the world. And I think a lot of you might agree with me. There's this overweening and overwhelming uh, pressure from outside for us to kind of wall ourselves off from the rest of the world for the protection of everyone else. That's, that's the official line, right? And yet, if you do some research on your own, if you actually start to listen beyond the sort of CNBC stuff and the, the occasional uh, World Health Organization or, or CDC um, uh what are they called? Oppressors that happen. If you talk to some epidemi epidemiologists who are actually on the ground in different places, who aren't parts of the major kind of public health establishment, you hear that more and more people are coming to the conclusion that it seems to be the best approach to, to the remainder of this virus seems to be to do everything you can to safeguard the population that is most at risk. Because if you look at the numbers, and I'm not going to be providing you know analysis of all this, but if you just look at, at the percentages of people who are dying who are not, it's really an overwhelming uh, majority of people who are dying are above a certain age. And so more and more people who are um, actual doctors and actually know what they're talking about, people like uh, the doctors in, in Oxford's uh, Center for Evidence-Based Medicine, some ER doctors in places like Italy and Spain, a Nobel Prize winner named Michael Levitt, who himself is not a doctor, but who's looking at, at, the, uh, at the data, is suggesting that what seems to be the best approach to going forward is to continue a lot of the social distancing kind of stuff, but going out and interacting more because there is going to be, there are going to be some major repercussions from this uh, narrative imposed from outside that you have to ward off the danger and keep yourself in the apparently fully 100% safe space of your own home. This is a really interesting and a very unusual thing, but I'm not going to go farther into that. I think there's a lot that can be talked about that, but later. What I've noticed in myself is that whether or not I agreed with that general narrative, and I generally, I have a strong reaction against it, 
Uh, for whatever reason, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm right, that's not the point. The point is that I've started to imbibe the idea that it's perhaps better to avoid difficulty. Whether or not that's the intended result, what's ended up happening, especially in matters having to do with family and having to do with my own spiritual life. Whenever there are moments, and you know these moments, they happen a lot. It's a moment of decision in your life. It could be a small thing. It could be your child comes up to you and it's five o'clock in, in the afternoon and you're tired and, and your son says, can you play this thing with me, this game? And your immediate reaction is, I'm tired. I've been working all day to you know make money so I can feed you, child. Leave me alone. I need time for myself. And that, I've been doing a lot of that. But that's a moment of two roads diverging in a wood, metaphorically speaking. And suddenly I realized that for months now, I had been choosing the easy path almost constantly. And it struck me that, wait a minute, look at these people doing this eco-challenge thing. They are purposely embracing difficulty as the thing that they want to do. There was one guy that was around 65 years old who had Alzheimer's, and he was doing it to show that that need not stop you. Is that the kind of thing we're seeing Trump trumpeted in the media? as a response to disease? Are we seeing stories about people going out into infested regions, helping uh, populations that are especially at risk? Are we seeing stories like that? No, we're seeing stories vilifying people who punch people because of masks. That's the kind of stuff that the New York Times is publishing. And if you look at history, and if you read historical accounts of plague times, the things that end up making it to the history books are accounts of people going and sacrificing themselves for the sake of others. Do you see any of that sort of narrative being encouraged by the media, by the CDC? By... No, maybe for good reason. I don't know. I'm not judging. I'm just, my point here is to say that this narrative has, I think for myself, and I think many of you will agree, has unconsciously or consciously pushed all of us to assume a posture of, I am helping others if I am doing nothing difficult for myself, because that is being safe. Except if you if you actually stop and pay attention and think about it, nothing in life is worth living or doing or enacting or getting into at all unless it is difficult and unless it hurts. This is just a fact. And seeing these people in the Eco Challenge do it really, really reminded me of it. Uh, there's some comments here I wanted to uh, feature, except I've forgotten how to do that. Oh, there we are. Uh, Nicole says, have I heard of the Mongolian endurance race? I forget the official name, but it's horseback riding across Mongolia. Kind of Hidalgo-esque, but as you know, with extreme Mongolian climate. Look, I would personally love to do that one of these days. That, But that sounds like expeditionary racing. It sounds like one of, one of the sub-races that these professional athletes get involved in um, throughout the course of the year. Honestly, I'm looking at this and I'm like, I could never do it, but boy, do I really, really want to. Now, combined with all of this, um, oh, Nicole comes up with another very good point, and I'm going to say, uh, Father, have you heard, have you read Apostle to the Plains about Father Nicola Yanni? He succumbed to Spanish flu mere hours after collapsing upon returning home from making rounds ministering to the sick. Yeah, I haven't read the book, but I've heard about him, and of course his story now is, is good. I'm afraid that, that the official uh, narrative is one to actually uh, vilify somebody like that. Sacrificing yourself for the good of others... Now we're told that putting yourself in a, in a position where you can become a risk to someone else by being a carrier or whatever is actually morally wrong. So that and that means if you if you extend it logically to its to as far as it goes, that means that anybody who goes out of their way to go and help others, other than essential workers, of course, is actually doing something immoral. And this the whole by the way the moralization of pol of political. Um, stances and because that's what essentially what it is there are different ways of dealing with with uh pandemic and epidemic and we're seeing different countries do it in different ways but notice that only one way is officially recognized by the new york times and other uh and and other media and the, and the cdc and notice how many times places like uh sweden which tried to do a different strategy who knows if they succeed or not we will know probably only next year or the year after but we see we hear hardly anything positive about them uh, Elena says she had just finished it. That book is so inspirational. Maybe maybe that's something that you all should consider. But the other thing that really got me thinking, and the other thing that really 
uh, got me thinking about myself and worried about myself and what I'm doing. And all of this has to do with storytelling, by the way. And I'll get I'll get around to that. So it's not just me ranting about the world. But this is it was a passage in the Lord of the Rings. I we had just finished. Now, if you don't know, I have a book club uh, on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Nicholas Kotar is my Patreon page, uh, my Patreon um, community, if you'd like to check it out. We have a book club uh, of um, a few uh, very active members and, and some not so active, but the uh, the active ones are very active and we have some really lovely times together. So I highly recommend that you check it out if you have a chance and if you're interested. We just finished reading The Lord of the Rings. And in The Lord of the Rings, there are some in absolutely incredible passages um, that, the, that really bring out this embracing of hardship as a mindset, as a kind of uh, foundation for living that made me think and that really made me want to reconsider, reconsider how I just make those daily decisions and also how I relate to others and how I relate to, to the world as it's, as it's, seems to be going completely insane just outside of my window because i honestly do believe that the individual choices of people not of groups but of people have can make a big difference not merely to one or two people around them but these differences they compound because every time you do a good action a virtuous action it compounds people see it they want they pass it on, they do it more, and those repercussions go on and on and on, and they don't stop. In the same way, every time you do a negative one, it has the same effect, sometimes even worse. I wanted to... There was a section, or s a several, several sections of The Lord of the Rings, where Frodo and Sam specifically are brought in front of the realization, the harsh and difficult realization, that they, have been, that they are alone in the middle of a wasteland, a wasteland that's doing everything it possibly can to kill them. They have this object of immense and incredible evil on them that is constantly trying to subvert their will, and they're trying to destroy it. And they have literally no hope of making it back because they have no food, they're running out of water, and they know that as soon as they destroy the ring, they're going to be in the middle of a land whose entire existence is tied into the power of the ring. So as soon as the ring uh, uh, breaks, uh, as soon as the ring is destroyed, the whole land of Mordor is going to come apart at the seams, as was shown actually quite effectively in the movie. There are other things about the movie I don't like, but that's neither here nor there. And yet, and yet, Frodo says it out loud to Sam. He says, I don't think we're going to make it. I'm going to try to find it. I keep forgetting... <laughs> I keep missing. Uh, I keep missing this spot, but it's such a great passage, and I really want to read it. Give me a second. I should have, of course, done it in advance. Of course, I didn't. Uh, if if I don't get it, then I'm going to just re. Uh, recapitulate what is going on without telling you, but without reading it. Yeah, I can't find it, and I'm not going to waste your time looking for it. But basically, there's a few spots. There's a few. The first one is almost at the very beginning of the section uh, in the Two Towers when uh, Sam and Frodo are going off on their own. And Frodo basically says, Sam, do you honestly think that we're going to be able to either make it all the way, I don't even have hope that I'm going to make it all the way, or two, make it back home? We're, doing, we're going to our own death. And Sam takes Frodo's hand, he kind of caresses it, he, he looks over, he, he starts to cry over it in this interesting and kind of a very touching gesture of reverence for somebody who is not as equal, by the way. That's another thing the movie's got wrong. Sam is very much in a servant, in a position of servant, which is another important point. All these things we talked about, in, by the way, in the book club, if you're interested in analyzing stuff deeply and listening to people having opinions about things, then go ahead and check us out. But the point being that... The point being that... They accept it. They accept the difficulty of what they have to do. 
not as inevitable, not with this sense of, I will go to the end and then I will die and it will all be over and I can finally rest at that point, which seems to be the, the modern or postmodern way of, of dealing with difficulty. But rather, looking at it as a duty. This word, so rarely used. The duty then is to do this one thing that will probably kill me. Why? Because it needs to be done. And there's literally nobody else who can do it. Literally. He is the ring bearer. If he gives it to anybody else, the ring will probably eat that other person alive. Have him or her for lunch. As we see repeatedly with Gandalf refusing it, even Galadriel refusing it, both of whom are already ring bearers, so they know what to do with the ring. I mean, incredible stuff. And then there's that other scene where uh, Sam is lying uh, next to Frodo. Frodo's passed out in Mordor itself. And suddenly there's a parting of the, of the, sky, of the uh, clouds and he sees this single white star that smites his heart with beauty. And it's this... Um, uh, beauty tinged with uh, joy tinged with grief as, as Tolkien so often has in his, in his wonderful wonderful stories and at that moment and that is one of the central moments in the whole book he realizes that all of this is a passing shadow that even though he's going to die even though the ring is going to take over the world if they don't do this it's still a passing shadow and there is an ultimate harmony and goodness and purpose and meaning beyond all of this and that is the reason why you do what you do why you follow your duty even if it leads to your death that's how sam sees it frodo as well and here at the end of the th and, and this is why when frodo finishes he looks at sam and says i'm glad i'm with you samwise gamji here at the end of all things he's about to lie down and die and there's nothing but joy in the fulfillment of his calling in the fulfillment of his virtuous duty in the fulfillment of that difficulty that most difficult thing that anybody in the history of middle earth had ever done that thing that then uh, justifies him being honored in a song in an epic poem even before he dies something that happens to absolutely nobody right a wonderful wonderful scene after they wake up and the the minstrel comes out and sings of frodo and the nine fingers and the ring of doom and sam breaks down in tears because this was his one the one thing he hoped to see but all of this and why, I want, why I'm talking about this on, a, on the channel of a fantasy author is because Sam recognizes that this is how you live. How does he recognize it? Because he recognizes it from the stories that he was raised on. There's a wonderful, wonderful scene where he says, uh, where, he talk, where he talks about um, how the people who are within a story are continuing the the story that has been going on from the beginning. And in the story, they don't realize that they're in the story. They're not thinking about the fact that, oh, we're in the middle of the hero's journey and we have to get to, you know, the, the dark night of the soul so we can then, you know, uh, achieve personal transformation and then come home and, and scour the Shire. Right? We don't think about that at that moment. We think just about getting to the end. But it's those people in those stories who are doing just those small things, those small steps, taking those little, without reference to the larger picture, they are the heroes. They are the ones that are remembered. Where are those heroes now? I'm not one of those heroes. I'm not, one, I'm not going out there. I'm not going out into uh, places where the, where the virus has spiked and even in, in order to take care of those people. I'm not. I'm not going specially into nursing homes because those places are the, uh, are the most heavily hit. Something like 50% of all deaths in the United States happened in nursing homes. I mean, it's an insane number. Insane number. And even if I wanted to, I wouldn't be allowed. I mean, this is what's, what's the crazy the crazy part of it, is that the, the narrative is there. The possibility is there. Christians are everywhere. They have been forever, and they've been doing this sort of thing through from time immemorial. But now for the first time ever, it's as if the story itself has stopped because there's no opportunity for us to even do it anymore. Not that I would. So I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking about this, and I'm, and it's bothering me very much. So... I start I start thinking about how you know I can talk about this till I'm blue in the face. I can comment on this till I'm blue in the face. I can write angry posts on Facebook till I'm blue in the face. But what if the better thing to do would just be to live your life in such a way that every single difficulty you encounter on some level you embrace it just for the sake of the difficulty. Why not start living purposefully to enjoy the lack of comfort why not even do something silly as take cold showers in the morning by the way it's awesome 
I've started doing that. I love it. There are some, there are some amazing things that come from that moment of, you know, intense pain when the cold water comes down on you. But then there's so many good things that come afterwards. What a great image of that, of that pushing through the, the difficulty in order to get out to the other side. And it's something that I realized happens all the time in Russian fairy tales. In Russian fairy tales, the hero always has to endure some moment of difficulty. Now here's where the Russian fairy tales are different from the sort of self-help inspirational narratives that have become popular now, and by the way, that are failing us miserably right now in a time when we need not self-fulfillment, but other fulfillment. But that's what we're going to talk about in a, di on a different in a different week, not today. But all of those stories involve a moment when the main character, whether it's a prince or a princess or a peasant girl or the idiot who, who lies uh, on top of the stove all day and doesn't want to do anything, they have a moment where they have to embrace a painful difficulty. And it is in the embracing of the painful difficulty that they end up coming through the story. It's not in doing something heroic. That's how all Russian fairy tales, almost, are structured. There isn't this necessarily, it does happen sometimes, but most of the time it's not about doing a heroic deed. It's actually more about enduring difficulty, unfair difficulty, impossible difficulty, heroically. That doesn't mean you can't uh, mourn. In fact, the, the Prince Ivans of the Russian stories cry more than almost any other character in any other stories. They're always cry He's always crying. But that's a external manifestation of his internal compunction in the process of accepting the difficulty that he finds himself in. And in the acceptance, strange and wonderful things happen. Don't believe me? Well, now is, here's your chance to find out what I'm talking about exactly. Because just yesterday, uh, Ancient Faith Media launched my new podcast, In a Certain Kingdom, uh, which is available now already at Ancient Faith, at the Ancient Faith website. You can also find links to it on my website at nicholaskotar.com, and you should be able to find it on your podcast catchers within the next day or two. It is already available on iTunes podcasts in a certain kingdom. The first three episodes of the of the of the first season, which will be ten episodes, are available now. And if you like what I'm talking about here, if you're interested in trying to make some sort of meaning out of the either the chaos that's going on outside, meaning that you can apply personally to your own life in a way that doesn't involve you going on Facebook and yelling at people for being idiots, which is what everybody seems to be doing, but actually changing your life so that the little decisions that you make, that I make, that we all make on a daily basis, even when it comes to simply choosing to get up half an hour earlier to make your wife breakfast in bed. These are not small things, by the way. These are heroic gestures. If this is something that interests you. If you are interested in seeing how these old fairy tales can help us become resilient, become comfortable with discomfort, I recommend that you check it out. Because in the first three episodes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. I'm talking about fairy tales as a filter or as a prism through which to see real life. Fairy tales, I believe, aren't simply stories we tell children for uh, entertainment's sake, although they are entertaining, that is for sure. Uh, Lisa, thank you for that comment. Uh, thank you for that comment. Um, it's it's always very pleasant to hear that people enjoy it. the thing you spend months on. So I appreciate that very much. But really, check it out in a certain kingdom. Let me know what you think. Share it with your friends, and let's start talking about this reality that I think we should all embrace, a reality where we consciously resist the narrative that by keeping ourselves personally safe, we are going to save the world. I'm not talking about the specifics of mask wearing, social distancing, etc. I'm talking about the idea that the best thing you can do right now for your society is keep yourself personally safe. That is a strange idea. And it is certainly not a Christian one. The Christian idea has always been, where is it hardest? 
that's where I need to be. Christians aren't living like that anymore. And because of that, Christianity has come into a lot of dis, uh, dis, uh, disrepute. That's not a word. Sorry. I'm only a writer, after all. But now, we're vilified, rightfully so, very often. But now, we have the, the strange added reality of not really being able to do much because of the physical limitations that are happening around us. So since we can't go and sacrifice our lives by saving people who are dying in hospitals, because they won't let us into the hospital in the first place, the best thing we can do is embrace, I think, difficulty in the small things in our everyday life. Why? Because if this thing becomes worse in the winter, if there is a second wave, and we react the same way as we did in the beginning, by freaking out, by closing all our doors, by shutting down all our windows, by not communicating with anybody, and by screaming at anybody who came anywhere near us, which, by the way, a lot of people are doing still on the streets, if you so much as get as getting you know close to them. If that's how we react to this, it won't matter if we prevent people from dying. Because that's not a life. That is, that is an absence of a life. What is the point of living a safe existence if it does not have the profound and painful richness of interpersonal relationship and communication with people. Yes, by all means, do it on Zoom. I don't care. My What I'm trying to get at here is let's start pushing back in our own personal lives, not out there on Facebook in comment sections. Let's start changing the way we respond to hardship by embracing it and not by running away from it. There are plenty of examples of how this is a good thing. A bunch of them I share with you, shared with my newsletter subscribers today. I have a newsletter. I write it every, once every two weeks. In it, I share news about my own business, about my writing, about my projects. But I also make a point of sharing interesting and edifying articles so that you don't have to go and find them and this time around i found some really really wonderful content i found first of all i directed people to my own post about kingfishers about the symbolism of kingfishers because there is something about the image and the beauty of the kingfisher who is the theme by the way the symbol and the theme of my new website that exactly encapsulates the diff the intense difficulty of achieving something worth achieving I also shared with my uh, subscribers an Art of Manliness podcast, a conversation between uh, the uh, host and a young man who had severe anxiety and suffered from very serious panic attacks all the time, who managed to, to actually heal himself of the panic attacks. He was still uh, occasionally subjected to anxiety, but he no longer had panic attacks merely because he forced himself on a year's journey of embracing discomfort in intentional ways. Every day, he would do small and large things that would make him feel uncomfortable and sometimes give him pain. As a result of embracing this kind of lifestyle, which, un whether you like it or not, is actually something that's good for us, he was able to overcome and no longer have his panic attacks. A fantastic and really interesting conversation. Highly recommend it. I share it with my, like I said, with my newsletter subscribers. So if you're interested in getting this kind of information, sign up for my newsletter over at my website. Um, I also shared this really cool idea um, that the uh, that happens in Scandinavia of uh, going out in the middle of winter and uh, sleeping outside. <laughs> There's a word for it. I'm not going to read it. I can't read Norwegian or, or Swedish. I'm not sure which one it is. But it's a thing they do with kids sometimes. And boy, what kind of a, what a wonderful thing that is. If only to build up your immunity and to be able to make you the kind of healthy person that is more able to withstand pandemic kind of situations. Something that nobody seems to be talking about much. Nobody seems to be talking about the fact that people who are generally healthy seem to be getting through this thing without as heavy a, uh, a sickness as those who have uh, accompanying conditions. Again, I'm not going to go into that because everybody has an opinion. And that's not the point of this, of this, converse, of this little conversation that we're having uh, with each other. The and the final one, um, uh, Paul, yes, exactly, Nicole. Polar Plunge 2, exactly. And finally, I just wanted to direct you uh, to uh, my, my Patreon page one last time 
if only to let you know that we just finished reading the Lord of the Rings and we're about to start a new book. And that new book is going to be uh, The Book of the Dun Cow by Walter Wangerin, or Wangerin, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, Jr. Uh, one of my favorite books of all time. It is a wonderful little uh, fable uh, written in the style of medieval uh, tales, medieval uh, fables. But a book that has a lot of good things to say to our time about evil, about the nature of good, the nature of temptation, the nature of order, the nature of chaos, and how to harmonize and how to make something useful out of the difficulty and pain of everyday life. Followed immediately by Gene Wolfe's wonderful Wizard Knight novel. We're going to read it as a single novel. It was published as two. We're going to read it as a single novel. So that's going to have us going probably all the way to the end of the year. So now's an excellent time to join if you're interested. We do have a really fun time. Uh, it's a, There's a private Zoom room that we uh, meet in once every two weeks. Everybody has a chance to talk. Everybody has a chance to, to make uh, their own comments, to, to share their opinions. And there's always something that we learn from each other. Something We always come out of it with a sense of having... Um, having had wonderful fellowship, but also coming, we having come out of this with some knowledge that we didn't have before, some enrichment of some kind. So check it out if you like. Um, and that's what I want to talk about today. I'm going to be uh, coming on live uh, fairly frequently, once a week probably, to talk about storytelling, to talk about the world we live in right now, and to especially uh, bring your attention to how the stories that we read the books that we read, the stories that we tell ourselves and, and tell each other, they are much more important than we might initially think. Because if we passively con if we passively approach story, we are always consuming it, whether we like it or not. And until we recognize that what we are consuming, whether it's the news, whether it's information we get from the internet, whether it's just being on Facebook, it's always coming at us in a narrative way because that's the way we perceive reality human beings perceive reality through story it's just a simple fact and if we don't recognize that that is the case and if we don't take the further step of then determining how that narrative is told first to ourselves and then to others then we are going to be among those who every time there is a new danger close our doors shut our windows wrap ourselves in plastic, get into a corner, and cower. And that's not a life. That's no, that's no way to live. And unfortunately, a lot of people are doing this. Still, there's a lot of fear out there. And some of it's justified, but some of it is a result of bad storytelling. Now notice, those of you who like to notice these things, I have not said a single thing about any conspiracy theory about anything, and I'm not going to because I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about any of those things. I'm talking about living in reality. And whatever that reality is out there, the kinds of story we tell, stories we tell ourselves and each other go a long way in giving us the right tools to be able to deal with each other and with ourselves in productive useful and ultimately edifying ways so i don't want to that's what i want to leave you with at the end of this week if you want though access to those uh, stories that i mentioned here uh, send me a message i will send you those links or i'll just send you a, a copy of this week's newsletter if you like it you can always subscribe anyway that's all i had to say today and um next week what i'd like to talk about is why and how we need better stories in our everyday life. Something I talk about a lot, but I'm going to get a little bit more specific on this. So I will see some of you next week. Same time, same place. And um, if this is something you enjoyed, tell your friends. 5 p.m. Friday next week, we're going to talk about something else. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming by. It's a good group today, active. Nice to see you all. Appreciate the comments. I appreciate the conversation. Uh, and um, stay safe, everybody. Stay healthy. But I'm talking about your spiritual self, not just your physical self. All right? Do whatever you need. Fill yourself up however you can with the good stuff. And let's all try a little bit 
in our everyday decisions to embrace that pain, to embrace that discomfort a little more. I think we're going to appreciate it on the other side of this madness that we're living in because there is an end to it. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, everybody else. I'll be signing off. See you all.